I will introduce myself. I'm Jim Gustafson, professor of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Medical School, uh, giving my seventh of 36 lectures every Friday, posted on YouTube by mid-afternoon. Today's lecture is called The Physics of Our Subject. The core idea of the first six lectures is that our patients are captured by getting too close to dangerous forces. Where, whereas they might step back from such forces and re-enter them from a different position. Today I want to discuss the danger of getting too close to violent flattening of curved space. First, the geometry of physics. Uh, modern physics arrived at a unified field theory of all the forces, uh, which stems from a lecture uh, on June 10, 1854, by Georg Bernhard Riemann called on the hypotheses which lie at the foundation of geometry. This is essentially Einstein's geometry that he borrowed from Riemann. To be extremely succinct about it, Riemann imagined that all the forces of concern to physics could be imagined by something like this, a crumpled piece of paper. Uh, where the curvature of the paper is most acute, the forces are the most powerful, most extreme, and vice versa. Where the smoother the surface and the curves, the less dangerous the forces, the less forceful the forces. Now, did I not say I'm most concerned about the violent flattening of space? This. Yes. Uh, but to understand the flattening danger, we have to go from this physics to the physics of our neural instrument, which we'll now do by the diagram on the left. This um, is a way of explaining how 10-dimensional space uh, comes down to the synchrony of one-dimensional space. So at the bottom of the diagram, we have 10-dimensional space, which is the maximum that human brain seems to be able to do by EEG. In other words, 10-dimensional space it f seems like incoherence. It's like when you have a dream and it, you can't remember it because it has so many dimensions. Yeah, all right. Uh, and so uh, this is a model of our minds. Uh, it's, this is a very simple model of our minds. And I'll now explain to you the experiment that was done uh, with this diagram by Matthews and Strogatz. Essentially what they did is they took a set of li coupled limit cycle oscillators, a set of them, and varied the coupling. It's uh, limit cycle oscillators. It's something that oscillates, <laughs> and you can you can couple them together either very loosely or very tightly couple them. With very loose coupling, the oscillators become uh, chaotic. That's the bottom part. So that's if they if the coupling is very loose, you have incoherence. Um, and with very tight uh, coupling, you get um, synchrony, which is the top of the diagram. In other words, I should say that the, the, the y-axis is, is the tightness of coupling, or the looseness. And then the, 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 the x-axis is the amount of frequencies that you're dealing with. But the most interesting part, and the whole concern of the lecture, has to do with this region in the middle with a moderate degree of coupling, you get this incredible phenomenon that's extremely practical for us, and that is that you get cascades of, of order and cascades of incoherence that, that can, one can turn into the other just like that. And the whole instrument is tuned to this, which all our brains are tuned to this possibility. I'll explain that. So the region of, t I drew a red line up at the top because the region of tight coupling is into synchrony is, is essentially violent. Rather than the play of, of order and, and disorder, which is in the center in, in, in moderate coupling, uh, a lot of high, di hardly any coupling at all is very useful as a reservoir. It's like the night sea. You can dr draw possibilities. So it's not, per se, a danger. But synchrony is a, is a very serious danger for the human being. And I'll explain that, and we'll get very practical about it. 
And the other thing is when you have too many frequencies uh, and, and a lot of synchrony, you get essentially that everything cancels out and you get amplitude death. So now for the playing field. This, I'm going to just, Ed, we can come back here. This beautiful region in the center of the diagram of coupling and frequency range is like a beautifully tuned musical instrument, which we were just discussing. It's neither too tight nor too loose in its coupling, but beautifully in between. And it has neither too few nor too many frequencies, but a moderate amount of frequencies to manage. Also beautifully in between. This is the region of play, which I think is the most important subject for psychiatry, which I'll now explain practically. It's the, and Huizinga, my favorite historian, modern historian, said that this is the home of all well-being in humanity as a playing field. It's where all the creation occurs. It's where all the transitions can be made. It's where everything beautiful is. In fact, Huizinga called it a whole semantic complex. And here's how I summarized him in my last book, The Contest, the contest like a tennis match or a whatever, soccer game, with its balance of rights between antagonists in the delimited playing region and time brings about a certain complex of virtues everywhere in the world in the archaic or Bronze Age of humanity. The whole semantic complex of strength, valor, wealth, right, Good management, morality, urbanity, fine manners, magnanimity, liberality, and moral perfection. This is the place where it always shows up. And if you're not there, it doesn't show up. Nevertheless, such a world was not to last forever, as Hoisinga wrote. He, died, he, he, was, he was Dutch, and the, when the Germans took over Holland, he ended up in prison and died of, of a massive... Uh, flattening of space by the Third Reich and, and its synchrony in Holland, it killed him. The old cultural soil, he says, is gradually smothered on a rank layer of ideas, systems of thought and knowledge, doctrines, rules and regulations, moralities and conventions which have lost all touch with play. There's a field, I think it's called psychiatry, that has this problem slightly. So that, see, if, if the incoherent high dimensionality of the mind is 10 dimensions, right? And, and, if it and you can have a beautiful playing field which has smooth curvature in it. How do you finish them off? You just go like that. A bunch of papers, a bunch of, a bunch of, it's, or, you do the, or, you can, or you can do this too. So there's a very big danger, and now I'm going to tell you very practically what this comes down to, and I see I have about three minutes to do it in. That's just fine. Just a little bit on Shakespeare um, and his physics. Uh, just, it'll, I'll just give you one sentence to show you how extraordinary his physics is and how it's all about this. Um, this potential from synchrony to cascades of coherence and incoherence to pure chaos is what Stephen Booth has been describing for over 40 years in Shakespeare's writing. The general tendency in the reader, according to Booth, is to read coherence from the context. By tight coupling, a synchrony is generated. In contrast, the action of Shakespeare's words and phrases is to generate cascades of contradictory possibilities. Now just take one simple sentence of Shakespeare. You can take any sentence from Shakespeare. She that would alter, pause, services with thee. Reading in a hurry, she that would alter services with thee, right? You get a flat line. You get, you get that. You get this. Doesn't mean too much, does it? It means an exchange of services. But if you slow down, read slowly, and less tightly coupled to the pace, one begins to hear things like altering services. Services being what? Religious, sexual, and so forth. You see. In that pause between the two halves of the English Shakespearean sentence, this is the whole world. Now, okay, how does this change what we do? And it's time to get very practical, right, Neil? Thank you for raising your eyebrows. I made some progress on this subject 17 years ago. There's a book I wrote, uh, The Dilemmas of Brief Psychotherapy. You can rush to Amazon for that, too. 
where, where I demonstrated the huge forces generated by the curvature of the geometry in two regions, uh, that of the social body and of the body. Both act as strange attractors to bend space around them. The social body will bend space around it. It will curve space. And the body itself has the same potential. For example, the horns of the dilemma with a chronic mental patient bend the doctor's mind either towards the social body's interest in control, which is scientific will, or the body's interest, as you know from working on any inpatient service, unlimited romantic claims generate another kind of curvature. Now you can look at the diagram on the right. Um, have a look at that. Ed, we can <coughs> you, see the, you see the two horns of the dilemma. And we're going to talk about a patient who was diagnosed with schizophrenia, claimed he did not have schizophrenia, and wanted, and wanted to join the Army, and wanted me to write a letter saying he didn't have schizophrenia so he could be in the Army. Nice little dilemma, huh, Chris? Kevin, yeah. Um, and now, the two red, you see the synchrony problem, the, the red lines there. Either of these perspectives uh, th will, destroy a case, will destroy what you can do with this case. Um, and I, and I, as I was writing the lecture this week, I, I think every time we see someone, there's a danger of flattening the case by, by trying to con by control from the outside or too much uh, uh, amplitude allowed from the inside. People either get too little or in, in much too little is expected of themselves or much too much. And they're both dangerous. And we'll flatten the results. So um, that, that's a playing field there in the middle. Now I, I'm going to give a very succinct discussion of what I did with this case. The patient discussed had been dis diagnosed with schizophrenia in the hospital. But he'd stopped taking antipsychotic drugs because he didn't want to. He thought they were unhelpful. And he actually began graduate school. And he was doing quite well. But he wanted our backing and, and myself as the attending in the clinic to join the military. I did not want to get caught up uh, on either horn of the dilemma. I did not want to s insist that he did have schizophrenia because it wasn't clear that he did. He had been psychotic. Nor did I want to be writing a letter recommending him to the Army where he get, you know, could easily be too grandiose about what was possible. So I agreed that he might prove the hospital wrong about the diagnosis in graduate school. That's a playing field that, it seemed to me, he might be able to do more but not, uh, not put himself in too much danger. As in other words, I found the region in between the two horns of the dilemma where there were unexpected compromises. Now, Ed, if you're not back here, you can come back here for the last sentence of the lecture. 1202. Indeed, you just found me locating a defensible playing field for this young man between the army as too demanding and too demanding of him and a diagnosis of chronic paranoid schizophrenia too confining. Thank you.